workplace, and all the ants you see walking around are sterile female workers. And I'm going to be talking today about work that I've done um, since I was a grad student at this site in southeastern Arizona. Uh, it's very near the Mexican border and the border of New Mexico. And the name of the species is Pogomormix barbatus, which, um, believe it or not, we call pogos. And they're harvester ants. They eat seeds. So this is a nest of a mature colony. There's the nest entrance. And they leave the nest on this um, foraging trail, sometimes cleared, sometimes not. Maybe 20 meters from the nest, they gather up seeds, bring them back, and store them inside the nest. And the process that I think about, um, that I'm going to talk about today, is what I call task allocation. So given that in an ant colony, there is no central control, there's nobody in charge, the queen doesn't really tell anybody what to do, how is it that ants who can respond to only very limited local information in the aggregate adjust the effort they devote to different tasks in response to changing conditions? And that process is the process that I call task allocation. So I divide all the behavior that I see outside the nest into these four categories. Foraging, an ant that's foraging is moving along in a stream of ants, um, goes out, searches for food, comes back, brings it back into the nest, and I'm going to be talking a lot today about foraging. The patrollers, um, shown here with a, this is meant to be a magnifying glass, uh, go out early in the morning, they walk around, um, they meet the neighbors, the ants, the patrollers of the neighboring colonies, and they come back inside the nest, and it's their return that tells the foragers it's safe to go out. The nest maintenance workers work inside the nest, they make the nest, and they maintain it, and they carry out the garbage. And then the mitten workers um, actually put a chemical signal on the garbage, so they play with the garbage. They make little piles um, of the husks of the seeds that the ants eat, and also pebbles that they collect and cover the nest mound with, and they put a chemical marker in the uh, refuse, in the midden. So all the ants look alike, so you can't tell which task an ant is doing by its size. You may have some time seen one of the relatively few species of ants where the workers come in different sizes, but that's not the case in these. And the ants that I'll be talking about today, the process that I'll be talking about today, are done by only about 25% of the colony that works outside the nest. So the nest goes down about um, two meters. There's about um, there's a cone-shaped mass of <clears throat> massive chambers about as deep as the mound is wide. And uh, the ants that work outside um, <coughs> go in and out of the nest from one large or a few large chambers just inside the nest entrance. So they mostly stay at the top of the nest. If you mark ants outside the nest and dig it up, you don't find the outside ants very far down. Inside the nest is the queen. All she does is lay eggs. Um, because these ants, like most ants, can't see, they communicate by chemicals. And there's no way, even if the queen were smart enough to direct the behavior of the ants outside the nest, which she isn't, uh, there's no way that she could get the chemical messages through this whole network of chambers to the ants outside. So she's inside laying the eggs. The youngest ants take care of the brood. So ants, like all insects, start out as eggs, and then they are larvae, and then they become pupae, uh, like the cocoon of a butterfly, and then they emerge as adults, and once they come out, they don't grow anymore. And most of the food of the colony goes to feed the larvae, most of the food it brings in. Then there are ants that process the food. So when a forager comes in, it just drops its seed right inside the nest entrance and waits around till it's ready to go out again. And that's the process I'm going to be talking about today. And other ants come up from underneath, and they take the food down, and they husk the seeds and store it. Um, there are the nest maintenance workers that are maintaining the chambers. Um, and then there are a lot of ants that are just hanging around doing nothing. So despite what it says in the Bible about, you know, look to the ant, thou sluggard, and all that, um, a huge number of the ants are just um, basically doing nothing. And I don't know whether to call them reserves. That is to say that if there were some emergency, they would come out. And I just haven't seen such an emergency in my 25 years of looking. Or they really are inactive. And I think one of the interesting questions about how the whole system works is whether there might be some function to this inert group of ants who don't interact um, or who uh, dampen the effect of interactions. 
So uh, when I started out working on the system, the first question I asked about task allocation was whether the ants engaged in one task affect the ants engaged in another, or if each uh, group of ants could be considered to be working independently of the others. So I did a series of experiments where I changed the conditions affecting one group of ants. So for example, I put out piles of toothpicks early in the morning near the nest entrance, and the nest maintenance workers came out, moved the toothpicks to the edge of the nest mound, and that caused an increase in the numbers of nest maintenance workers. And I looked to see if that would change the numbers doing some other tasks like foraging. And I did that with a lot of different tasks. Then I repeated the experiments with marked ants. Um, we used to mark them with model airplane paint, but now we have these sophisticated Japanese markers. Um, basically, we paint them to distinguish individuals. And it turned out that the different tasks are always interdependent. The numbers performing one task always affect the numbers performing another. So for example, if I make a big nest that the nest maintenance workers have to clean up, the foragers just stay inside the nest. They're less likely to forage. And that was true for all the pairwise combinations of activities. The next result of these experiments was that ants actually switch tasks. So for example, if I put out extra food, there's an opportunity to get more food. The patrollers stop patrolling, the nest maintenance workers stop doing nest maintenance, the midden workers stop doing midden work, and they all change to become foragers. But not all the transitions are possible. So this shows how they switch tasks when more ants are needed in a particular task. So when more foragers are needed, as I just said, the patrollers become foragers, the midden workers become foragers, the nest maintenance workers become foragers. When more patrollers are needed, the nest maintenance workers switch to do patrolling. But when more nest maintenance workers are needed, once an ant leaves nest maintenance, they won't go back. And they have to get new nest maintenance workers from the younger workers inside the nest. And I, um, until now, actually, we're just doing this. We haven't been able to manipulate midden work enough to know um, where, where the new midden workers come from. So there's a, a flow um, where foraging acts as a sink, and the ants inside the nest act as a source, which makes sense in an environment where, um, as we learned, these ants are competing for food. So um, uh, mobilizing the foragers when more foragers are needed is really important. <clears throat> and the last um, result of this, these experiments was that each ant must be making moment-to-moment -moment decisions not just whether to be a certain kind of, do a certain task, but whether to do it actively right now. <coughs> so when I first got these results, I thought that maybe the reason when there was more nest maintenance, there, were, there was less foraging, was because the nest maintenance workers were switching to forage. But when I realized that it never happens in that direction, it means that instead, when something happens outside the nest that causes the recruitment of extra nest maintenance workers, the foragers, um, a distinct group of workers, are less likely to be active. So that led me to start asking, what are the decision rules that each ant uses to decide what to do? And we know that ants, of course, respond to what happens in their environment. If ants didn't respond to what they find around them, there wouldn't be more ants at picnics because they wouldn't notice the picnic. But also, ants must be responding to each other, or it wouldn't be the case that something that affects the numbers doing nest maintenance would affect the numbers foraging and so on. So um, given that ants are really not very smart and that they can only respond to what is locally around them, I've been trying ever since to figure out what are the decision rules that each ant is using that in the aggregate produce the task allocation of colonies. And one of the most surprising results of these experiments was that the um, response of a colony changes as the colony gets older and larger. So a colony is founded by a single queen. Uh, this shows how colony size and thousands of workers changes as a function of colony age. And these colonies live for 20 to 30 years. Yeah. one answer? So a worker lives a year. But the queens can live for, um, now we have some that have uh, lived for more than 25 years. So a colony is founded by a single queen. She, um, they reproduce in an annual mating flight. You may have seen flying ants. Um, and uh, what happens, and many species of ants reproduce this way, is they send out the winged virgin daughter reproductives, the daughter queens, and the males. They all go someplace, they mate, the males die, and then the queens fly off, the newly mated queens fly off 
drop their wings and start a new nest. So a colony begins with zero ants, just the founding queen. And in this species, it grows to a size of about 10 or 12,000 ants by the time the queen is five. And that's when she begins to make daughter males and female reproductives that go to the population's mating flight. And it stays at about this size until the queen dies. And when the queen dies, eventually the workers die and they don't adopt a new queen. So once the queen dies, the colony is doomed. Um, but it might take about a year because the workers live a year for the colony to die completely. So I did these experiments with colonies that were really young, um, about two years old, and colonies that were at their mature size. And the differences were that the older colonies were more consistent <coughs> and more homeostatic in their behavior than the younger ones. And by more consistent, I mean that if you do the same experiment with a group of older colonies, week after week, you get, uh, with different groups of older colonies, week after week, you get pretty much the same results. So all older colonies respond pretty much the same way to the same perturbation. Whereas in a group of younger colonies, they will all respond the same way this week, but another group of younger colonies will do something different next week, suggesting that they're more susceptible to whatever is different about this week and next week. And the other difference is that the older colonies are more homeostatic. Uh, that's a biology word, but um, I think there's a physics word for that too. Is it hysteresis? Um, where, uh, no, the wrong word, sorry. Um, so uh, maybe homeostatic is a word that's familiar to physicists. Anyway, the more you hassle them, the greater the magnitude of the perturbation, the more older colonies will act like undisturbed colonies. Whereas younger colonies, the greater the magnitude of the perturbation, the more their behavior changes relative to an undisturbed colony. And what was surprising about this is that since an ant lives a year, there's no, this isn't due to the behavior of older, wiser, more experienced ants. So the ants in the older colony are not any older than the ants in the younger colony. And remember that the queen isn't directing this. So it raises the question, what is it about the way that the colony functions that would lead to a different outcome in older colonies and younger colonies, and the obvious thing that's different is that an older colony is larger. And so I started to look for ant decision rules at the level of the individual that where the ants could be using the same algorithms in the small colony and the large colony, but the outcome would be different just because the colony is larger. Uh, one more thing you need to know, and I guess this is really the only place where I'm going to talk about exactly about how they move around. Um, in the sense that uh, we heard a lot about it yesterday. So this is a picture of how the ants of different tasks move. Um, this is the nest entrance. This is um, a Swiss Army knife for scale. These lines show the foraging trails. So the thin solid lines is a foraging trail here, here, and there. Um, this is where the nest maintenance workers come out, and put down their um, dry sand that they carry out of the nest, and go back in. Uh, these are the midden workers, the heavy lines. Um, there was a midden here and here. The controllers are, at this point were going around the edge of the nest mound. And the, um, the point of this is that the ants performing different tasks are in different places outside the nest. So they don't have the opportunity to interact with each other. A forager way down here can't interact with a midden worker here because they're just not close enough to even perceive each other. But it's hot in the desert. Um, ants use water by being outside. So no ant can stay outside very long. Um, the longest trips, thank you, the longest trips are by the foragers who might um, be out for 20 minutes at a time. But they meet when they come in and out of the nest entrance um, as each ant comes back from its trip. They, they mix just in the chamber just inside a nest entrance. So the interactions that I'm thinking about are actually the interactions of the ants as they come in and out of the nest entrance and are waiting to go out again. So I started to uh, work with the hypothesis that an ant might use the pattern of its encounters, the rate at which it meets other ants, to decide what to do. And it seemed to me that this could be an algorithm that would produce the results that we've seen because everything else being equal, um, an ant in a small colony is going to meet more ants than an ant in a large colony. So if I can get this to work, um, which I know it's to try and show a movie on a Mac at this meeting, but I'm still going to Here we go. So um, I'm going to show you first some film taken through a fiber optics microscope looking into the nest entrance. So here's the nest entrance. There's all the ants doing their thing. And 
what I'm suggesting is that an ant uses simply the rate at which it meets other ants to decide what to do. So the ants, um, for example, you're going to see some nest maintenance workers coming up carrying some stuff um, on their way out of the nest, like that's the stuff. In the beginning, they're pretty much concerned with the fiber optics microscope, but um, eventually they, they calm down. And the, um, ants smell with their antennae. So the actual interaction I'm talking about is when one ant touches another with its antennae. And when it does that, it smells the other ant. And so the process that I want to be talking about today really is how an ant uses the rate at which it encounters other ants in this um, messy situation. And now we're going to see some more um, satisfying close-ups of ants. These are just, just inside the nest entrance. And you can see that um, even though when you're, look, when you're looking at an ant, it looks like they just briefly touch antennae, Actually, um, what they do with their antennae is their main way of perceiving the world, and often these contacts are a kind of whole body experience for an ant. And so the idea that is that an ant has some simple rule like, okay, I'm a forager, I expect to meet a forager every so often, and if I do, my probability of foraging doesn't change. But if, for example, I start to meet a, more nest maintenance workers relative to foragers, then I'm less likely to forage. Then my probability of foraging goes down a little bit. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really fun to watch ants, but I'm going to go on. So if an ant is going to do this, it has to distinguish the task of the ants that it meets. That is, if it's going to keep track of the rate at which it meets foragers and nest maintenance workers, it has to somehow evaluate the difference between a forager and a nest maintenance worker. Now we know in all social insects that um, they are covered with a layer basically of grease. Um, you can think of it like Vaseline. It keeps them from drying out in, in the air. And that carries a colony specific odor. So any ant or wasp or bee, um, termites have this too. Um, actually many insects have these um, large chain fatty acids, like hydrocarbons, on their cuticle, we call them cuticular hydrocarbons, and that carries the colony-specific odor. And that's how an ant, when it touches antennae to another, knows that the other ant is a nest mate, and also um, any other social insect. But we found that, um, at least in this species, within a colony, ants also differ in their hydrocarbon profile according to task, in this way that the more, um, the ants that spend more time outside, the foragers and the patrollers, have a higher proportion of N alkanes in the colony specific distribution of different components in their hydrocarbon profile, whereas the nest maintenance workers who are mostly inside just come out briefly to carry stuff out of the nest and then go back in have a lower proportion of N alkanes. And we did an experiment in which we subjected ants from inside the nest to different conditions and we were able to make nest maintenance workers smell like foragers by exposing them to the conditions that foragers experience outside the nest, namely um, high temperature and low humidity. So in the course of doing its task, the ant doesn't secrete anything different, um, but its hydrocarbon profile changes as a function of the conditions under which it works. So these different hydrocarbon profiles don't make the ant do something different. You can think of it like the calluses on a carpenter's hand. They just smell different because of what they're doing. So now I want to tell you about how this process of interactions works in particular in the regulation of foraging activity. And um, by regulation, I mean that um, ants use these interactions to answer certain questions, or the colony does. First of all, whether to forage at all that day, because in this species, a colony doesn't forage every day, and it depends on the weather. And then where to forage, and that depends actually not on where there's a certain amount of food because they're foraging for dispersed seeds that are scattered all over the place, but instead um, on trying to avoid foraging in the same place as their neighbors because they're competing for food. And then finally, the intensity of foraging, how many foragers to send out. And that depends on water loss and search time. So first, these first two decisions are made by the patrollers. So, um, the patrollers come out early in the morning, so this is the hard part of doing field work with me, is that if you want to find out about the patrollers, you have to get up at 4.30 in the morning. They come out right at dawn, and they meander around, um, and then they come back, and they're the gatekeepers. They tell the foragers whether to go, 
and which way to go, and how they tell the patroller, how the patrollers tell the foragers whether to go. Um, well, we first notice that the foragers don't go out until the patrollers come back. Oops. Whoa. What was that? Wants to show you again. Uh, so the idea is that if the patrollers don't come back, the foragers don't go out. Come on, go out. <laughs> they never do what I tell them. But the computer usually does. Okay. Um, and so drawing on that, we know that if the patrollers don't return, the foragers won't go out. We, I want to tell you about an experiment in which we took away the returning patrollers so we could keep the foragers from going out. And here are some students doing that, taking away the, the, um, the diabolical hand with the glove, reaches down, grabs the, the returning controller, puts it in the box, and then the foragers won't go out. So um, working with Mike Green, who's at the um, University of Colorado at Denver, um, and he's a, a chemical ecologist, we did an experiment in which we were able, we removed the patrollers so the foragers wouldn't go out, and then we dropped into the nest um, glass beads that smelled like patrollers, that is, coated with the extract of the particular hydrocarbons of patrollers of that colony. And um, there are the beads. Uh, they look very nice, although the ants can't see them. Um, they can move them, but when they go clunking into the nest, it just kind of sits there, and then ants um, touch them because they're in the way. And the, those glass beads were sufficient to rescue foraging. So this shows the, um, uh, is a measure of the amount of foraging in response to live patrollers, so um, undisturbed control. And then we tried two different um, extracts on the beads. This is the whole lipid extract, and this is the hydrocarbons, which is a portion of the lipid extract. This is a blank control, just the solvent on the beads, which was pentane. And then this was um, beads that smelled like the wrong kind of ants that smell like nest maintenance workers, and you can see that um, just interacting with something that smells like a patroller is enough to get the foragers out. And this is how we learned that these task-specific differences among uh, in, in hydrocarbons is how the ants know which kind of ant they're meeting, because um, when they meet a bee that smells like a nest maintenance worker, it's not good enough. So, uh, the, to figure out whether um, it matters how quickly or how often they meet patrollers, we tried in introducing these beads at different intervals. So one bead um, uh, every three minutes, every 45 seconds, every 10 seconds, and every one second they should be shifted over. Um, this is another, uh, again, a measure of foraging. And you can see that they need to get the beads pretty quickly, um, one per 10 second, in order to respond. That is, it looks as though if a, a patroller shows up every 45 seconds or every 180 seconds, um, the ant forgets in between that anything ever happened. Um, it's not fast enough. And um, of course, um, I chose every 10 seconds because that's the rate at which I see patrollers coming into the nest when foraging begins. So we were even able to make the ants do something, which is really unusual. Um, by adding uh, beads earlier in the morning before they were ready to forage, and we could make the um, time until foraging lower by um, uh, adding beads. So it seems as though, and we don't know anything really about the neurophysiology of this, but it's consistent with a process like this, that every time an ant meets another ant, it stimulates something um, and uh, which has a decay. So there's some stimulus with a decay. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. What do you think is happening when the beads come too fast? I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, do you want to go back? Can you repeat the question? Please? What's happening when the beads come too fast? So let me go back here. So why is it that they, um, that too fast um, is somewhere in between? I don't know, and um, this is the problem with the story I'm just about to tell you, but um, I do know that the only time this happens in real life, that the ants come rushing in, is when there's something really bad going on. So it's as though they have some, some threshold, but there is some other response to too fast, and I don't, um, I don't know what's going on there. So again, this is the story uh, that is consistent with the 10-second result, but not 
quite with the one second result, which is that each encounter stimulates some response, it has some decay, um, that decay is somehow um, somewhere in the order of 10 seconds, and if they have enough uh, encounters, often enough it pushes them over some threshold probability to go out, but if the encounter happens um, too much later, then they've already um, basically forgotten it ever happened and the thing has to start over again. So um, what this all means for the colony that is if the patrollers um, return at a rate of one per 10 seconds, it means it's not blowing so hard out there that ants are getting um, blown away or it's not raining really hard. A patroller can get out, it can get back, and that means um, it's okay for foragers to go out. The patrollers also tell the foragers which way to go, and I don't want to say too much about that, um, except to show you this picture now of um, sort of zooming out. This is the nest mound. These are the foraging trails of one colony in one day, so sometimes they make a kind of a blob, sometimes it's something more trail-like. Remember, they're not recruiting to any particular food source. And um, the patrollers make a, a, a chemical mark on the mound just about 20 centimeters long, and it tells the foragers which way to go, um, so it doesn't. It's not like laying a trail to a food source. It's just pointing the direction, and um, that's the way the foragers go that that day. And that seems to have more to do. Um, so because food could be anywhere, the seeds are just distributed by wind and flooding. They're not telling the foragers to go to a place where there's lots of food. They're actually telling them to go to a place where they didn't meet the patrollers of the neighboring colonies. So. Now, the, the process that I want to tell you more about is what happens once foraging begins. So the patrollers come back, the foragers go out, and what determines how many foragers go? How do they adjust, adjust the intensity of foraging? So this depends, I think, on water loss and search time. And um, the colonies store seeds, so when we dig up nests, we find um, these beautiful caches of seeds. Foraging costs water because they spend water out in the sun looking for food, and they get their water from seeds, from metabolizing the fats in the seeds. And search time, how long it takes an ant to find food, is a measure of food availability. So um, a foraging trip of a particular ant, um, it leaves the nest, and it has some time that it just travels along one of these trails, and then it starts meandering around and searching, and as soon as it finds something, it goes right back to the nest. So um, it might go up, up to about 20 minutes from the nest, and the average time for one of these trips is about 20 minutes. The duration of a foraging trip depends almost entirely on search time. So if we look at the duration of the trips of marked ants, um, how long they spent, um, it's clearly a function of search time, and it's not a function of distance from the nest, because they, they travel really fast and most of their time is spent searching. And this means that um, the more food there is to find out there that day, the, more, the higher the availability of food, the less time an ant has to spend searching, the forager returns sooner. So there's a relationship between how much food there is and how quickly the ants come back. The forager return rate is a measure of food availability and they use this. How many foragers go out depends on the rate at which they come back with food. So more foragers go out when successful foragers return. So there is this link between foragers bringing food in and foragers just inside the nest entrance that have just come back um, going out again. So we've been doing experiments to figure out exactly how this works. And what we do is, um, so uh, these graphs show the same data in two different ways. This is the cumulative forager outflow. So we're just measuring the rate at which foragers go out over time. This is in seconds. So um, we remove the ants coming back in, and that's not shown on this graph. The ants coming back in with food um, for three minutes. And while we do that, and that started here, while we do that, the rate at which foragers go out um, responds really quickly, decreases, and then eventually recovers. So this is the same thing, um, but showing it in a different way. This is the rate at which foragers go out per 10 seconds. And you can see it fluctuates around a lot. And then we, um, about a minute after the removals begin, so the ants coming in are not coming in as quickly anymore, it goes down, 
and then it recovers. And these lines show the results of a um, maximum likelihood model where we try to establish the point at which the rate changes. So the ant is inside the nest, the forager comes back, um, forgers go out, they make a lot of trips, they come back, they put down their seed, they are inside the nest entrance, and whether a forager goes out again clearly depends on the rate at which foragers come in, because you can change the rate at which foragers go out by changing the rate at which they come in. So the returning forager is removed for three minutes, and the forager outflow responds really quickly to a change in the rate of forager return. And that speed was very surprising to me when we first got this result, because the seeds are going to be out there for days. I mean, these are not like the ants on your kitchen counter that the minute you drop a crumb, the ants are there. They're not an opportunistic species, but they are responding very quickly to a small fluctuation in the rate at which foragers return, um, which is a signal for a small fluctuation in food availability. And I think that maybe this is just set by that narrow window within which an ant can remember its encounters. So it depends on food availability. Um, it doesn't depend on the location of food, so I just want to tell you a little bit more of the story because I know everybody has in their mind the notion of ant colonies laying a foraging trail to a particular food source, which these aren't doing. So just to um, emphasize that, it turns out that on a given day, each ant goes to the same place on successive trips. So when the, the patrollers come back, the foragers go out, the foragers go out and um, each forager eventually finds food somewhere, and that's the place to which it will return over and over that day. So um, uh, it keeps going back to the same place. This is some work um, that um, Blair Beverly student did um, looking at the desti different destinations of the same marked forager. And successive destinations were always within about half a meter on a 20 meter trail. So that means that the return of foragers from one direction is actually stimulating more foragers in another direction. So a forager comes back with food and the rate at which that happens stimulates the rate at which foragers waiting inside the nest go out again, but it could easily be that a forager coming back from one place is telling a forager, another forager, to go out someplace else. So it's the regulation of foraging by interaction rate, but it's not by recruitment to a specific location. So um, what I want to do now is to um, uh, ask you to help me think about um, the part of this that is puzzling me that is um, exactly what is it that the ants is doing. So here's the story that the, um, we can see that ants respond, the ants waiting inside the nest respond to the rate at which foragers are coming in. But if we look now, this is the um, average of 42 of these experiments. And um, what I want you to see here is that it's really noisy. So here, um, these are the standard errors of the means um, for all these different experiments. Here's where the removals start. And there is this characteristic drop. And um, then it goes down. The picture I showed you before, they recovered, but sometimes they don't recover. Um, but my question is, um, with such a stochastic input, and again, such an imprecise response, we are talking about ants here. Um, it's not, um, they're not rocket scientists, you know, they um, don't respond very deterministically. If you've ever tried, if you've ever watched ants closely, you will see that um, they bumble around, they don't go where you think they should go. Um, it's not conceivable that an ant is calculating anything very complicated about some moving average or, you know, integrating anything. Um, so how is it possible that with such a noisy process, um, what kind of algorithm could the ant be using that would make this response possible, um, given how stochastic it is? And I've been puzzling over this with Susan Holmes, um, Daniel Fisher, who it seems lots of you know, and Adam Getz. And um, one of the things I want to show you about these results, in case anybody has any ideas, is first of all, um, colonies differ a lot in foraging activity. And this is really interesting to me for um, evolutionary reasons. Uh, because colonies are persistently um, more active foragers, and it doesn't seem to depend exactly on colony size. But anyway, here's just a better foraging. These are all names of colonies, and the idea is that they're different. Like this one doesn't, 587 doesn't forage um, nearly as much as uh, whatever this is, you know, 154. And foraging changes from day to day. 
So here's some different days last August, and um, this uh, August 14th it was a much better foraging day than August 8th. And we find that foraging doesn't respond to removal when the rate of um, foraging is really low. So on days when foraging is really low, um, we take away the returning foragers, and we can take away the same number of returning foragers, although it takes longer to get them, and they just don't respond. So we just don't see that drop. So that's one puzzling thing. It seems as though the ant has some threshold rate at which it just um, keeps going no matter what, and there has to be um, a, a, a substantial, it has to be high enough for them to detect the change. That's the only way I can explain that. And um, the other thing is, um, I need to explain this way. So now I'm showing you a picture of the rate at which foragers are coming in and the rate at which they're coming out. Before I only showed you the rate at which they're coming out. <clears throat> and so if we start removing foragers and um, the, the rate at which they're coming in goes down and a little bit later, the rate at which they go out goes down and then and this recovers and then this recovers. And so if we um, just invent a measure of the amount of this drop, which I'm going to call in drop and out drop, um, and hope that you people who um, are able to understand all those amazing graphs that went flying by yesterday will understand this relatively simple graph, I hope. So if we plot um, the, um, the magnitude of the drop in the ants going out in response to the magnitude of the drop in the ants coming in, um, what's puzzling is that it tends to occupy this space rather than, for example, this space. That is, it seems as though the, um, the strongest reaction is to actually a small change in the rate at which they come in. And um, when there's more of a change here, so this is more negative, more of a drop, you don't see more of a response. So it's, first of all, the rate has to be pretty high for them to respond, but when they do respond, they actually respond most in the small range of the um, stimulus. And um, I see people nodding, and so my hope is that this is going to remind somebody here of some process that's familiar to you, and I'd really like to hear about it. So there's more response to a smaller change in forager return, and um, and maybe somewhere in that is the, the key, the answer to this question, which is, what are the ants doing? Um, what is the algorithm that the ants are doing? Um, but I want to end by saying, um, uh, whatever the algorithm is, um, one of the reasons that I want to know is to ask a separate evolutionary question, and I just want to mention this briefly. Um, so colonies differ in foraging activity, and as you know, um, natural selection acts on variation. And what I would really like to understand is whether colonies that differ in foraging activity also differ in reproductive success. That is, is natural selection acting on the algorithm that the ants are using? And, um, and is there, um, does it matter to the colony whether they respond in a more sensitive way to the change in food availability? So is natural selection actually acting on regulation of foraging? And this is an empirical question. I know that um, from far away, it looks like in evolutionary biology, we just kind of have to tell a story about what the function is of some trait that we see, and that's good enough. But actually, um, in some cases, we, we can demonstrate whether natural selection is acting. Um, and uh, what I'd like to know is whether better foragers have more offspring. And that turns out to be a tricky question because of the inconvenient way in which they reproduce, where they fly to this mating flight, and then they fly off at random, and I don't know which colonies are the offspring of which other colonies. Um, but um, uh, this doesn't show up, but uh, a graduate student has just finished um, this genetic analysis, basically a kind of DNA fingerprinting to match up parent and offspring colonies. So after a long time of doing this, um, uh, using this map I make every year census in this population, we're able to identify which colonies are related to which other colonies. So I can say, and it's just been amazing for me to say, wow, you know, colony 199 turns out to be the mother of colony 579. <laughs> Who would have thought, you know? And then we can, so we have grandmas, we have offspring. And so we can ask whether colonies that behave in a certain way are likely to forage in a certain way. 
And what I would really like to be able to do, um, if I could understand this algorithm, is to ask what is the relationship between variation among colonies in the particular algorithm that the colony is using and reproductive success. That is, if a colony, say, you know, um, back when I used to think it was a simple rule, which I don't anymore, like I need to meet, you know, five foragers in the next 10 seconds and I'm willing to go out to forage, that colony is going to forage more than another colony that insists on meeting 10 foragers before they're willing to go out. Um, now I don't think the algorithm is that simple, but if I could measure differences among colonies in the algorithm that they use, I could ask whether colonies that are just foraging more precisely are having more offspring, and whether that algorithm is itself heritable, so that the parents, uh, the, the offspring of really sensitive colonies are themselves really sensitive, and whether natural selection is acting on the regulation of foraging. <coughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. Can we go to your central question, that, that uh, box diagram? Is sure. Zero? And, 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 I mean, mathematically, that's not a function, right? Because you have this, you have many values of the output for one value of the input. Is yeah. This is this is actually describing a region where if um, I just didn't make lots of dots. So if we look at the results colony by colony, or actually trial by trial, you'd see a lot of dots in here and only a few dots in here. But you're saying I could have a little infinitesimal decrease in the in rate, and then my out rate could vary a lot. Yes. But 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 then does that also say if I have no variation in my in rate, the out also varies a lot? I and mean, what happens when I go, you know, if I go a little bit to yeah, the, maybe to I the should, right? Yeah, um, maybe I should just um, move this over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah, because, no, it, so, sorry, the answer to your question is no. Um, around in here, I can't, it's just noise. It's just noise, yeah. Yeah. On, on, the, yeah. on that same graph, it's, it's have you tried drop, uh, sorry, increasing the in rates by dropping more ants in? Um, is we that, that's can, so hard to do. Yes, we can increase the in rate and we can get more ants to forage. But we, we can't, we um, did an experiment where we tried um, little uh, chips that smell like foragers or food or both, and they only increase in response to both. So we can increase the rate a lot. And so, why am I, oh, just came out. Um, uh, so I, that's a good question. You're asking like, how would this part look? And um, that's a good question. I, um, we didn't increase it much, but I guess I could try to match up the magnitude of the, um, the amount of stuff we added to the amount that it increased, and I, I haven't thought about that. Was, she said, was Meredith saying make it positive? Move the she was saying yes. what happens yeah. when you make it positive, and we can make it positive a little bit. I mean, we succeeded in making it positive a little bit, and I haven't tried to vary the extent to which I make it but positive. I thought your beads was making it positive, and then it went down again. I thought that was the dropping. Well, that was getting the forgers out in the first place, but we actually did another experiment I didn't tell you about last summer where we did put in um, beads that smelled like food and foragers, and we did make them forage more. So um, I could try to plot that on the same scale, and that's a good idea. Right. Um, so a couple of questions. First of all, you keep saying that they're noisy and they're not so smart. Uh -huh. yeah, is the reason they're noisy is because they're not so smart and they can just cannot avoid being noisy, or it doesn't give you even some beneficial strategy in an unpredictable environment with smart. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's part of this question of is it better for them to to adjust more precisely, or is it better for them to just kind of keep plodding on and go out there and look for food no matter what's happening. And it really has to do with the extent to which the burden of water loss affects their reproductive success. That is, is it worth it to the colony to hold back on its effort um, in conditions when there's not so much food there? And how much does it matter how finely they adjust that? And I don't know. Um, but I don't think it's noisy because they're stupid, because it's noisy, the rate at which foragers come in is noisy, because it takes different foragers, different amounts of time to come back. So they're just coming back when they find food and they're not all 
taking the same amount of time, so it's noisy because the world is noisy, not because of them. So, and the second question is, uh, can you do the longer time uh, sort of variation to see if there's some adaptation? You mean if they, if, if a you don't, learns? You, you keep on taking, uh, keep the, the, the rate at the small rate, will it eventually go back to the steady state one, or? Well, the, no, they don't cooperate with that, because if you take away too many ants, they just stop coming out. So. <laughs> I have a comment about the, you also said that they don't integrate, but that's, I think, um, I heard some story um, that was related to the way that they go out, search for food, and then know how to come straight back to the nest, yeah. which says that they do integrate. And if they do integrate, then I think a lot of the response functions that you're seeing, you can try to use sort of standard control theory, like PID controllers, uh, to try and explain. Those are similar to the curves that we get, for example, when we do perturbations on our, our fly experiments. So, Which are some of this? No, go oh. back. Um, oh, the, so the, the response the, function, when you take away the ants, you saw that dip uh -huh. in the red curve. Yep. Yeah. And, um, oh. sorry. Yeah, those kinds of things. Or even, there was one. Um, with the overall. Yeah, with yeah. the overall that, yeah. that showed it. So. Well, maybe we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, those ants are, um, the cataglyphus seem to be very special ants that go around in the Sahara and think deep thoughts and know where they're going and so on. So, um, but I'd like to know more about what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Um, at the you said you no longer think that they obey a simple rule, like if I don't see a forager in uh, 10 seconds, I'm not going to go out or whatever. Yeah. Uh, why don't you do that anymore? Well, it's partly because of this picture that I just uh, because because it's not a simple function of the rate at which they're going in. So you may have some way to um, imagine that process as as simple, and I just don't know what it is. I, I guess I don't understand why this changes Sorry. the model of. Uh, why this this picture? It, because it, it, there doesn't seem to be a simple correlation. I should say that we looked, um, we've been looking for correlations like um, between the rate at which they go in and the rate at which they go out. We don't find any simple lab. We count all the ants coming in, we count all the ants going out, we look for cross correlations, and we don't find any obvious <coughs> correlation. And that doesn't mean that they couldn't be doing something simple that we just haven't seen. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're going to have to. Uh, Cut it here and save the rest for the discussion. So let's thank everyone once again for okay. listening.